Appreciate you so much. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the grace of God. Thank you, Father, that when we were lost through Jesus, you reached out to save and redeem us. Father, tonight, as we talk about the world, a world in deep trouble, grant to us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to comprehend the reality of the coming of our Lord to bring hope to this world in Christ's name. Amen. Our topic tonight is a world in turmoil. Is mankind's end really near? Pilots have a very difficult time navigating if the airport they're flying into is nestled in the mountains. In fact, on a clear day, it's difficult to land. But if that clear day changes to fog, the dangerous approach even becomes more dangerous. In December of 1995, an American Airlines pilot was flying into Cali in the interior of Colombia. As he flew in, his worst nightmare occurred. The cloud levels were low. The airport was fogged in. It was necessary for him to make an instrument landing and to have clear signals from the control tower. The individual at the control tower spoke Spanish. He, the airline's pilot, spoke only English. And as they attempted to communicate, there was a miscommunication. Now, we can't be exactly sure why the accident took place, but when the FAA investigated it, they discovered that there was some garbled message. The airline pilot banked as he misunderstood the message, and in the deep fog, banked into the mountains, and the plane crashed, and everybody aboard was killed. A garbled message, a misunderstood message, led to a fatality. Indeed, planet Earth is spinning through space at some 66,000 miles an hour. The fog is thick. The runway approach before the final touchdown of Earth is treacherous. Indeed, it's important to have signals of where we are and understand the signs just before that final approach. Jesus' final message to, of, to mankind is a message of hope. It's a message that speaks to men and women in a society where there is deep trouble. In fact, Jesus said this to his disciples as Christ sat on the Mount of Olives. He looked out and said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Then he went on to say, you believe in God, believe also in me. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I will come again. So Jesus said, when you see wars, when you see conflict, when you see strife, when you see famine and earthquake and pestilence, when you see rising crime and violence, when you see difficulties on earth, let not your heart be troubled. So Jesus' message is one that lifts us above what we see. It lifts us above the morning news. It focuses us on the event that's just about to take place. Jesus said, I will come again. Not maybe I'll come again, not perhaps I'll come again. Jesus' statement is clear, I will come again. Later, seated on the Mount of Olives, Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem and he pointed to the temple, that great magnificent temple. And Jesus said, 
that when the Roman armies attacked Jerusalem, they would not leave one stone upon the other. The disciples looking down at the temple thought that an event as cataclysmic as the destruction of the temple, an event as earth-shattering as the destruction of the Jewish temple, the disciples thought that that must surely be the end of the world. So they said to Jesus as they sat there, as Jesus described the Roman armies coming down to attack Jerusalem, an event that would take place in 70 A.D. As the disciples heard that event, they said to Jesus, Master, we have a question for you. Yes, Jesus responded, as he always does graciously to our questions. They said, tell us, when will these things be? That is, when would Jerusalem be destroyed? When would Titus's armies come down? When would that destruction occur? Then they said, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? You see, the disciples thought that any event that was so earth-shattering as the destruction of Jerusalem, that must be the end of the world. So they said to Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus then, in a masterful presentation, described signs that in miniature would occur in the first century that would lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem by Roman soldiers under Titus. Then Jesus outlined to those disciples the fact that those signs in miniature in the first century would be on a universal global scale in the last century. Now, let me insert this. Tonight we're going to look at the signs Jesus gave of his soon return. And as we look at these signs, you might be led to ask a question. And your question might be, haven't those signs been present in the world since the first century? Indeed they have. Jesus said that they would be in miniature in the first century and then be in every century. Then you say, what's the difference then? How could they be signs of the end? Today, those signs are occurring with increasing magnitude. Today, they're occurring on a universal scale. Today, they are occurring together all at the same time. So it's not that these signs never occurred before. It's their frequency. It is their increased tempo. It is the fact that they all are happening in one generation. What are those signs? Those signs of Jesus' return those signs that Christ gave because the disciples said, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus said, these signs will occur. And so Christ lists more than 20 different signs. Tonight, we're going to look at the 15 major signs of Christ's return. Jesus began by talking about false Christs and false prophets. He said, in fact... In Matthew 24, verse 5, 11, and 24, for false Christs and false prophets shall arise. Jesus said just before his return, there would be an explosion of interest in psychic phenomena, an explosion of interest in the New Age movement, an explosion of interest in the occult, an explosion of interest in the paranormal, an explosion of interest in things like astrology. In fact, there are over 3,000 astrology columns in North American newspapers. Today, I was talking a little earlier to our translators, translating this message in German and Romanian and Yugoslavian, Croatian and Serbian, talking to the translators from Europe and around the world. And I said to them, is there an upsurge of interest in your country in astrology, in the occult, in the dark scientists and sciences and they said yes those occult magical arts are exploding in our countries indeed 3,000 astrology columns in newspapers around the world you know a friend of mine Ralph Blodgett in, his, in the formerly these times but now signs of the times magazine did a survey of the astrologers predictions and this is what he discovered he studied 250 specific published predictions of the astrologers. He found that less than 3% or 6 out of 250 
might be reasonably listed as fulfilled, but 97% miss the mark completely. Now look, I don't care who you are, but I think you could guess better than that. What do you say, friend? Indeed, Jesus said an explosion of interest in psychic phenomena, an explosion of interest in the occult arts. You know, I live in Thousand Oaks, California, not far from Hollywood. And there's a rage now in Hollywood. Many of the Hollywood personalities have really troubled lives. They have marriages that are in deep trouble. Many of them have problems with alcohol, drugs, and other problems. It's a well-known scene in Hollywood that many of the Hollywood personalities have deep problems. And so a lot of them are turning now to spirit guides to tap into the occult or spiritualistic or New Age movements. For example, one rage in Hollywood is seeking spirit guides like Mafu, Ramtha, and Lazarus. Now this spirit guide, Lazarus, has a two-year waiting list for private consultations at $93 an hour. Now you can reach out and touch Lazarus by phone and have $53 billed to your credit card. I don't recommend it, friend, and neither does Jesus. Amen. We have a sure word of guide in God's word. But these, indeed, are indications of the coming of Jesus. False Christs and false prophets. The New Age movement taking the world by storm. False concepts of meditation where people try to meditate on the God within them. The only meditation I want to do is meditating on the Word of God. Meditating on the Scriptures, on the Psalms, the Proverbs. But the Bible says that these signs indeed would be signs just before the coming of Jesus Christ. Secondly, there would be international conflict, Jesus predicted. In fact, Jesus said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now notice Jesus doesn't say there will be a war. Folk, haven't there been wars down through the centuries? Haven't there? But what did Jesus say? There will be not a war, but what? Wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Universal war. Conflict on a global scale. Conflict on an international scale. As you and I look out over our world today, it's well to remember that in this century, we have seen World War I and World War II. In World War I, there were some 20 million deaths. In World War II, some 50 million deaths. This century has experienced the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, with a million North Vietnamese, rather a million South Vietnamese, half a million North Vietnamese, thousands of Americans killed. In fact, the Indochina War, taking tens of thousands of lives, the Algerian War, the bosnia Herzegovina War. Somebody said, Mark, I think you spelled Herzegovina wrong. I checked with the Yugoslavians today. If you have any questions, ask your Yugoslavian friends. It's pronounced Hertz like the rental car, Govina. Thank you very much for my critics who always tell me I spell stuff wrong. Bosnia and Herzegovina war. Tribal wars in Africa. The bloody, the 20th century is the bloodiest century of them all. Ladies and gentlemen, these prophecies are indeed being fulfilled before our very eyes. Wars and rumors of wars exploding in this century. Jesus said, first, false Christ and false prophets, the occult, spiritualism, the New Age movement, indeed being fulfilled. Jesus said, war and rumors of wars conflict and strife indeed occurring around the world. Jesus goes on as he discusses it with the disciples. He says, Luke 21, verse 25, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the wave roaring, distress of nations, the marching feet of the armies throughout the world indicate that we are on the verge of the kingdom of God. Sign number three, Jesus would come at a time 
that the world would have the potential for world destruction. Never before in history has the human race had the capacity to destroy itself. Never before in history have we armed ourselves to the teeth. Only in this century could the human race destroy itself. Thermonuclear warfare is a new introduction in our society. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, Revelation is the last book in the Bible, written to the last generation of men and women that would live upon a planet Earth, Revelation 11, verse 18, Christ would come to do what, friends? Read it with me, please. Destroy those who destroy the Earth. So Jesus would come at a time that the human race would have the capacity. Jesus would come at a time when the human race would have the wherewithal. Jesus would come at a time when the human race would have the scientific technology to destroy all life on a planet called Earth. Indeed, we have that capacity tonight. Never before in history have we had the kind of nuclear potential that we have tonight. In fact, Sir Charles Snow said this, we know with certainty of statistical truth that if enough of these weapons are made by enough states, some of them are going to blow up through accident, folly, or madness. You cannot continue to build nuclear weapons without some nation using them. At least five nations are known to have nuclear capacity. Many other nations are developing that nuclear capacity. You say, but I thought that we have diffused the nuclear threat. Well, if you have 11,500 nuclear warheads and you drop it down by 3,500 and you have 8,500, it's kind of like saying, well, a person was getting on the airplane and they had 11 bombs, but you took three away, so you have a lot of confidence flying now because they have eight, right? I praise God for all efforts toward peace, but the truth of the matter is, this world is a very dangerous place. But God says, Jesus says, let not your heart be what, everybody? Let not your heart be what? Troubled. Diffusing the nuclear threat, but there is a concern, and I would like to suggest to you that the world is less safe tonight than it was 10 years ago. Now, you may want to debate that question, but follow my reasoning. Time Magazine's article, What About the Nukes? Under the former Soviet Union, before the breakup of the Soviet Union, nuclear arsenals were guarded carefully. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, there, is, there are nuclear missiles, of course, in Russia. There are nuclear missiles in Kazakhstan. And there are nuclear missiles in the Ukraine. Since the breakup of the former Soviet Union, there has been some laxness in security. And there is evidence that some nuclear grades material has been sold possibly to Iran, according to U.S. News and World Report. Did you read the report about some nuclear material getting in the hands of undesirables and they were arrested in Munich, Germany? Or what about that nuclear catch that was being sold in the Baltic states? In fact, Popular Mechanics had a front page article called When Terrorists Go Nuclear. Now, this is frightening. In fact, January 1996, Popular Mechanics said, if a terrorist group or rogue state gets a hold of such material from smugglers, they solve the single most difficult problem in building a bomb. What if the cash-starved former Soviet Union, what if certain officials, what if plutonium and other nuclear grades material was sold? What if it went into the hands of terrorist states in the Middle East or other parts of the world, radicals? What if they held some Western states hostage? That scenario, according to some leading thinkers, is not part is very possible. It's not impossible. But friend of mine, Jesus says that he will come at a time that the human race has the capacity to destroy itself and things will become unwieldy before the time of the end. But thank God, Jesus says, let not your heart be what? Trouble. No, this world will not be destroyed in some spinning globe of ash. Although Walter Lippmann, the columnist, says, 
We are poised on the brink of the most calamitous conflict that can be imagined. Indeed, it cannot even be imagined. The good news is that Christ is on the way. The good news is that the second coming of Jesus is the blessed hope for a world that is in deep trouble. The Bible then lists the next sign, sign number four. Sign number four is fragile peace agreements. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, please read it with me. When they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, and they shall not escape. They'll be saying, peace and safety. That word safety comes from a Greek word meaning security. Security at home, peace abroad. They'll be signing peace treaties, but as soon as the ink on the peace treaties is dry, there will be more conflagrations. Look around the world tonight, a shaky peace. Would you agree with me that the peace in the Middle East is shaky at best? Would you agree with me that the peace in Northern Ireland is shaky tonight? Look at what happened in the last day or two. More car bombs going off in Northern Ireland, shaky peace. The former Yugoslavia, we pray for peace. We thank God that Bosnians and Croatians both are and Serbians are studying the Word of God in these meetings together. We believe Jesus, the Prince of Peace, can bring peace to any land. But shaky peace, Rwanda, Hutus and Tutsis, shaky peace. The former USSR, Chechnya, shaky peace. Armenia, shaky peace around the world. African nations, shaky peace. Some places in South America, shaky peace. We see it around the world. Jesus says, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Sign number five, famines. The Bible describes our day. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places famines. The truth of the matter is, although many of us each day get adequate food, we sometimes forget that around the world little children with distended bellies are starving. According to the United Nations environmental studies, three billion acres of productive land has been damaged by human activity since 1945. Technology and industrialization is destroying in some areas the ability to keep up with food production and land is being destroyed. Environmentalists are concerned about it. Look at some of the nations in Africa. In fact, Lester Brown, the president of the World Watch Institute in Washington, D.C., says the entire world is living hand to mouth, trying to make it from one harvest to the next. One bad harvest could plunge millions into famine. Take a look at the figures around the world. Approximately 57 million people die each year because of famine. This amounts to 156,000 people every day. Let your mind grasp that. 156,000 people a day dying of famine. Of the world's population of 5 billion, 60% are malnourished and 20%, according to the UN, are starving. Jesus said there will be famines, not a famine. But around the world tonight, these prophecies are being fulfilled. Now the problem is that with a growing population in the world, with an increased population in the countries that can't feed their multitudes, the problem gets worse. By the year 2050, Earth's population will be 9.5 billion. Today it ranges somewhat over 5 billion. Estimates are by the year 2120, it will be 12 billion. The problem of feeding Earth's multitudes is getting greater. It is not getting less in our world. The problem of famine, the problem of world hunger, indeed is a major significant problem. The Bible says there will be famines and there will be earthquakes in diverse places. Indeed, 
when you look out at the world tonight, there are famines that are devastating this world. How long will Jesus allow this to go on? Jesus, come quickly and save the little children starving of famine. Sign number six, there will be pestilences. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. What is a pestilence? How do you define a pestilence? The original word in the Greek language for pestilence, in the Greek language is the language of the New Testament, is the word plague or disease. So we might read the text, and there will be famines and strange diseases, diseases that antibiotics don't seem to touch. Just before the time of the end, we can expect unusually strange diseases, new plagues of AIDS, malaria, Lyme disease, the Marburg virus, Legionnaire's disease, the Hunter virus, new forms of syphilis and gonorrhea and cholera are all breaking out randomly around the world tonight. There are pestilences, strange diseases that seem to be baffling scientific technology. We create antibiotics, but there are strains that are resistant to those antibiotics. Jesus said, false Christs and false prophets, we see them. Rise of the occult, explosion in the occult world, we see it. Jesus said wars and rumors of wars, World War I, World War II, instability, we see it. Jesus said the capacity to destroy ourselves, it is here, nuclear weaponry. Jesus said there'll be movements of peace occurring in our world. Jesus said there'll be famines. Indeed, we watch before our very eyes and we see a hungry world. Jesus said there would be pestilences, strange diseases around the world. Indeed, they are occurring. The World Health Organization predicts 40 million cases of HIV before the, by the year 2000. These prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. Sign number seven, environmental pollution. In fact, the book of Isaiah, talking about the end of time, talking about the coming of Jesus, says in Isaiah 51 verse six, the earth will grow old like a garment. Now, when a garment gets old, what happens? Well, it might be frayed. It might have some holes in it. It might lose its color. It loses its freshness and newness. Is the earth losing its freshness and newness? Is the air, like it was in the Garden of Eden, fresh and clean? Is the water pure? Or do you have to even have a water filter at your house? What about the food? Is it free from pesticides? Indeed, the Bible says, remember Christ would destroy those that destroy the earth? One way to destroy the earth is through nuclear weaponry. Another way is through industrial techno technology, polluting the atmosphere. Remember, not long in, ago in Rio de Janeiro, a world conference on the environment called Save the Earth. So while human beings are talking about saving the earth, cleaning up the air, cleaning up the water, cleaning up the food, Jesus talks about saving the earth, and he says, let not your heart be troubled when the earth is polluted. Let not your heart be troubled when you can't breathe the air, when you can't drink the water. Let not your heart be troubled, because the solution is not in the hands of man. Jesus said, I will come again. When the, when the oceans are being polluted, I will come again. When the atmosphere is difficult to breathe, I will come again. A warning in Los Angeles. Do not exercise strenuously in a playground for children or breathe deeply during heavy smog conditions. Tokyo, in fact, some traffic police now in major cities have actually gone to wearing gas masks. Scientists frankly warn of the possible death of our planet, but yet, when for many, our planet is deteriorating, there is a blessed hope, the blessed hope of the coming of the Lord that will, that will create a new planet on this earth. You know, one of the greatest contaminants, greatest pollution, pollutants, is nuclear waste. 
What do you do with nuclear waste? Where do you dump it? This scientific article on the screen was entitled Nuclear Garbage, the Deadly Potential. Here is a map, each, a map of the United States. Each of the green circles you see on the map are places where the United States government has buried nuclear reactive material. Now look at the eastern seaboard, for example. Nuclear waste site after nuclear waste site after nuclear waste site. Look at the Midwest. Look at the West Coast. Now, we are told that this nuclear material encased in lead protective casing is safe. But what if there was an earthquake? What if some freak of nature released that radioactivity? I am not a scientist. I'm not smart enough to know exactly how that would occur, but I know this, the potential exists. Jesus said he would come at a time that men and women had the capacity to destroy themselves. And Jesus would say, gentlemen, ladies, it is closing time. The Bible goes on, there will be famines and pestilences. Sign number eight, Jesus said, there would be, what is it everybody? earthquakes. There is a whole lot of shaking going on. <laughs> Somebody said to me recently, well, Mark, I, I, I really question whether earthquakes have gone up. I think your statistics are out of date. We went back and checked with the Geophysicist Science, Geological Science Center in Washington. Each year we have 6,000 major earthquakes plus in the world. In fact, earthquake fatalities in the last 90 years, we've had 1.5 million fatalities from earthquakes alone. Earthquakes are on the rise in our society. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, and there will be earthquakes. It was in January, a couple years back, that I went to sleep one night regularly in my home outside of Los Angeles at 9 o'clock in the evening, 9.30. And at 4.17 in the morning, my wife grabbed me and said, Mark, Mark, what's, wake up, wake up. I mean, I even could sleep through an earthquake. And she said, something's going on. The chandeliers were dancing and, and the windows were crashing. Amazing. Our house was shaking. And so I got up out of bed and ran to my son. The bookcase crashed down in his bed. And we went through that Los Angeles earthquake. Indeed, the Bible says, there would be earthquakes, not only Los Angeles, the Japanese earthquake, the Mexican earthquake, the Alaskan earthquake, earthquakes around the world indicate in the increased earthquakes that all of nature has been thrown off its course. Something strange is happening. Why this upsurge in earthquakes with their resultant broken gas mains and fires? Then, sign number nine, the Bible teaches that just before the coming of Jesus, there would be strange phenomena in weather patterns. Notice, earthquakes, that's natural disaster. Famines, partially natural disasters. Drought, pestilences, diseases, fearful sights and strange signs in the heaven. Could that be tornadoes? Could that be hurricane? If the rest is in natural disasters. Upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and waves roaring. If you've ever been through a hurricane and you live on the coast, you know that the waves are roaring. The Bible says that there would be an upsurge in nature. Look, Life magazine. See, what we read in the Bible, you can read in the news journals today. The year of killer weather, Life says, why has nature gone mad? 1993 weather damage in the United States, a record 1,297 tornadoes in 1993. Well, you better add three because three came by Florida yesterday here. You remember those three that came by? We were ducking. Oh, no, that was 93. Well, every year, increase in natural disasters. This old world friend is groaning to be delivered. We're on the verge of the coming of Jesus. Did you read that article in Life magazine? When the big one hits, talking about a volcano, look, it says it will have the power of a million atom bombs. It says it will be heard a thousand miles away. And it could happen, Life said, sooner than you think. 
Let not your heart be what, everybody? Trouble. If I look around me, my heart is troubled. But if I look above me, there is a peace and confidence because these signs indicate the birth pangs of a world to be delivered. There will be increased natural disasters, fires, floods, strange Midwest flooding, torrential rains that come, weather patterns that are bizarre, upheaval in nature. Indeed, we experience these things, increased tornadoes, buildings blown apart. There is no security on earth. Increased natural disasters indicate that your home can be gone in a moment, flooded out, destroyed with a hurricane or tornado. The only security is Jesus Christ. The only security is knowing Him. The only security is the fact that when the winds of storm blow, Jesus is the peace giver, the peacemaker. He who calmed the storm can calm our troubled hearts. And He says, let not your heart be troubled. Indeed, Jesus Christ pointed forward to our day. He points beyond the headlines and he points to his return. Sign number 10, moral decay. Jesus said that before his coming, there would be a moral deterioration in our society. Jesus talked about the days of Noah and he pointed us back to Noah's day in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Just like the days of Noah. The world was destroyed by water then. It'll be destroyed by fire a second time. What were the days of Noah like? Well, the Bible says in Genesis 6, verse 6, and God saw the what? The what, everybody? The wickedness of man was great in the earth. Widespread wickedness. Widespread crime in Noah's day widespread violence in Noah's day, and the water fell. God said, this is enough. Earth was weighed in the judgment scale of heaven. There is a boundary beyond which God allows nations to go. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now what does the Bible mean when it says they're marrying and giving in marriage? Anything wrong with marrying? Of course not. But the Bible says marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, the looseness of marriage. Somebody said marriage is like a belt. You put it on and if it's too tight, you take it off and try another belt or another marriage. In fact, when you look at the statistics today, they are absolutely staggering. The marriage statistics for our day indicate that husbands and wives are having deep trouble. Trouble so deep that many differences apparently become irreconcilable. We are living in an age of rampant divorce. We are living in an age when the institution of marriage is falling apart. In 1900, there were one marriage in 12, one divorce in 12 marriages. 1930, one divorce in six. 1978, one divorce in three. 1995, one divorce in two marriages. Jesus said, marrying and giving in marriage. Teenage pregnancy is off the chart. Young people out of wedlock getting pregnant. Sexual immorality on television. Nudity paraded across the screen. The Bible says in Genesis 6 verse 5, every intent of the thoughts of his heart is evil continually. Jesus said, enough immorality. Enough sexual exploitation. Enough degrading that which is pure and holy. The thoughts of their heart evil continually. In fact, did you notice that recent article in Time magazine called Cyber Porn? Talking about the computer and the internet and Carnegie Mellon researchers? 
did a study and they said porn is immensely popular. In an 18-month study, the Carnegie Mellon researchers found 917,410 sexually explicit pictures, short stories, and film clips on the online. Oh, Jesus! Our hearts have wandered from you. Our natures are fallen and they turn toward evil. Oh, Jesus, change our hearts, change our minds. And oh, Jesus, come quickly and put an end to this filth and this smut on earth. The signs of the times are clear. The Bible describes that Christ's coming is near sign number 11. There would be rising crime and violence. The United States is in the midst of a political election. Incidentally, I would much rather know the word of God than to know the outcome of some election. That's why I think it's better to be here than just kind of eavesdropping on some debate. But I know none of you would stay away from my meetings to go to any political debate or even watch it on TV. So you better be here tomorrow night. We're going to take attendance. No, excuse me. Okay, side 11. Rising crime and violence. I see where your loyalty is tomorrow night. Rising crime and violence. The Bible talks about the days of Noah. And there in the days of Noah it says, Genesis 6 verse 11, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with what, everybody? Violence. Earth filled with violence in Noah's day. Today, the earth would be filled with violence. U.S. News report, feature article, kids who kill. In fact, my son happened to be playing basketball at a school in Los Angeles. And so I went with him to watch him play basketball. And when we came, we had to enter in through a very narrow, gated passageway. And there was a sign that said this. Students, please, if you have any weapons, check them at the office. No guns allowed on campus. You know, one news magazine said, disputes once settled with fists between kids are now settled with guns. Every hundred hours, more youths die in the streets of the United States than were killed in the Persian Gulf warfare. Our schools are becoming battle zones. In fact, in the United States, over 30 in North America, including Canada and the United States, over 33 million Violent crimes are committed in North America each year. Crime is exploding. Now, you may read some statistics that indicate that crime's going down, but that is not violent crime. The statistics indicate that violent crime continues to explode. In fact, 6,250 teachers suffer bodily injury each year at the hands of their students. 200,000 students miss classes because of being maimed or in fights or some violent activity. In Noah's day, what did the Bible say? The earth was filled with what in Noah's day? Violence. This is not a North American phenomenon. You go to any major city in the world, immorality and violence fill the world. Today, corruption, violence. You ask the Russians about corruption, it's there. You ask Eastern Europe about corruption, it's there. Immorality, it's there. Crime, it's there. Violence, it's there. Indeed, these Bible prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, puts it this way. Matthew 24, verse 12, please read it with me. As lawlessness... What would lawlessness do, everybody? What would it do? It would what? Spread. Men's love for one another will grow cold. Lawlessness would spread in our society. USA Today, USA's 1990 murder toll, this headline said, may be the worst ever. Sign number 12, an attitude of skepticism. There would be prevalent in our world before the coming of Christ, like there was before the flood, an attitude of skepticism. Do you remember that when we read the prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, verse 39, it said, they did not know until the flood came. That is, they could have known. Noah preached decade after decade. But they closed their ears. They shut 
their eyes. They closed their minds to truth. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4, scoffers will come in the last days. What days? The what? Last days. And who will come? Scoffers. Saying, where is the promise of his coming? In other words, it's the scoffers who say, where's the promise of his coming? They say, oh, we saw, we've always had wars. Oh, there's always been movements of peace. There's always been famines. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been crime and violence. They fail to see the increased frequency of the signs. They fail to see that all the signs are currently present and combined. And the Bible says that those with an attitude of skepticism, those with an attitude of unbelief, actually, without their even knowing it, are fulfilling Bible prophecy. Because the ones that are scoffing are mentioned in the Bible. Scoffers will come in the what days? Last days saying, where's the promise of his coming? So around the world, just like it was in Noah's day, oh, Jesus is not going to come. What are you, crazy? I mean, come on now. Are you some wild-eyed fanatic? I mean, you actually believe that Jesus is going to come? Do you have a better solution for the world's problem, brother? <laughs> Sister? Ma Ma'am? Sir, ladies, gentlemen, do you have a better solution? The best solution that I know of is the blessed hope. There is hope for this war-torn, weary world. There is hope for this confused, chaotic planet. There is hope for our children in trouble. There is hope for this polluted earth. There is hope in the coming of Jesus Christ. Sign number 13, lovers of pleasure. The Bible says that on the one hand, while they're scoffing, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, they'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of, of God. The sports stadiums are jammed. The casinos are jammed. In the United States, Las Vegas is the number one tourist attraction. It actually beat out Orlando. In fact, night spots are jammed. Bars jammed, parties jammed, amusement centers jammed, lovers of what? Pleasure more than lovers of, of God, a characteristic of our time. The Bible says that men and women in the last days would treat their body as a fun house rather than as the temple of God, lovers of pleasure more than God. 28% of all alcoholics are under the age of 18. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. In the past 10 years, cocaine use by teens has risen 400%. Why? Because when your life is miserable, you need some temporary high. At least people think they need a temporary high. Mass media has glorified sex. In immorality, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Bible prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. As you and I look, those Bible prophecies indeed are coming to pass. For this generation, God says, look up, my coming is near. God says the signs in the hourglass of time are running out. Sign number 14, economic uncertainty. Jesus said that before his coming, there would be signs in the economic world, signs in the financial quarter. Now notice, each of the texts I've read to you tonight are in the context of the second coming of Christ in the book of James. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. Now if misery is coming upon financially wealthy, that must indicate some economic collapse. Notice, your wealth has rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver is corroded. In other words, quick, rapid devaluation of currency. But as we go on, you have hoarded wealth together in the last days. This is in the context of the second coming of Christ. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The text goes on. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Almighty. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. There will be a wide disparity 
between those that have and those that have not. There will be ultimately, according to James, a economic peril, economic difficulty. Are those who forecast the economy, and sure, the United States right now is in a better economic condition than it was a little time ago, but these spirals come and go, but look at our national debt. According to the statistical forecast of the United States, James Pearson, 1993, in 1989, the United States owed $3 trillion. The forecast was that by 1999, we would owe $5 trillion. The truth is that right now, we are owing about $4.5 trillion. How can you possibly continue in any society when the debt gets so high and your debt service interest payments are so great? What if a couple major nations defaulted? What if inflation went runaway? Notice an article, The Economic Perils Ahead, Time Magazine. Some forecasters concerned the economy of Germany that was so stable a few years ago with the Union of East and West Germany, much less stable today. The economy of Japan in the yen was a standard. Japan is having its economic difficulties around the world, a shaky economy. Howard Roof wrote a book called How to Prosper in the Coming Bad Years. The way to prosper is, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. I will come again. There is a solution for the problems of this weary world. There is a solution for the problems of a world facing catastrophe. Sign number five, G number 15. Jesus said, this is the final sign. Jesus said, this is the last sign. Jesus said, when you see this sign, know that my coming is near. Jesus says, this is the last one. This is the final one. Matthew 24, verse 14, please read it with me. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. The final sign the last sign before the coming of Jesus is the gospel going to the world. Revelation says, I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven. An angel is a message. The message would fly in mid-heaven via satellite technology. It would fly via radio. It would fly via television, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Tonight, as you witness this experience, this experience, satellite technology to proclaim the gospel is a fulfillment of revelation, and it's Jesus lovingly proclaiming his biblical message to the world. Christ wants to get the message out. He indeed is using every way possible to get that message out. Have you noticed the marvelous events of the last few years? Have you noticed the fall of the Berlin Wall? Seventy years of communism. Seventy years of oppression. And yet, in an almost in it seeming like an instant, the prayers of God's people in Germany, East Germany, West Germany were answered. The prayers of God's people in Romania answered. The prayers of God's people in Yugoslavia answered. The prayers of God's people in Poland answered. The prayers of God's people in Croatia. The tyranny of the past came crumbling down. First little chips. I was in Hungary the night that the Berlin Wall fell. I was in Hungary holding meetings, 100,000 people marched in the streets. There, yes, the tyranny of the past, the militaristic regimes of the past. Men and women did not have the opportunity to hear the word of God. But God said, it's enough. God said, my people suffered tyranny and atheism enough. And so, men and women coming to Christ, you're looking at Moscow's Olympic Stadium. Thousands came there. They were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. All across Eastern Europe today, God is opening doors. Men and women accepting Christ. And you talk about Eastern Europe, talk about China. I was in China recently. Again, doors are opening for the gospel. 
underground presses printing literature, thousands of pages going out, house churches by the hundreds, thousands, men and women accepting Christ, following Him, being baptized around the world. This gospel of the kingdom, the continent of Africa, some countries experiencing a spiritual revival, some countries in South America, the gospel going powerfully, spiritual revival, thousands coming to Christ in Brazil, thousands coming to Christ in Mexico, large radio transmitters, one radio transmitter in Siberia covering a good portion of the world, indeed, thousands hearing the gospel. We are getting reports all over the world that it's closing time. Men and women accepting Jesus. Men and women coming to Christ. We're living on the verge of the kingdom of God. Amen. And tonight, our hearts cry out. In the sorrow of our lives, in the disappointment of our lives, oh Jesus, come quickly. Every time we lay a wife to rest, oh Jesus, come quickly. Every time we lay a husband to rest, oh Jesus, come quickly. Every time a child dies, Jesus, come quickly. Reading those reports of famine, distended bellies and little children, Jesus, come quickly. Reading those reports of the innocent suffering with violent crime and drive-by shootings, Jesus, come quickly. Reading those reports of earthquakes shaking homes and hundreds dying, Jesus, come quickly. Reading those reports of hurricanes and tornadoes, Jesus, come quickly. Reading those reports of broken homes and broken hearts and broken lives and shattered dreams and divorces. Oh, Jesus, come quickly. Listen as Ralph sings.